Uh, today I'm going to talk about virates, which is a subject I've been working for for a long, very long time. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for, for organizing this for me, for letting me present my work here, our work, our lab work. Um, so I'm going to talk about virates, which are uh, tiny, really tiny, as you will notice, pathogens, but very potent. In fact, they're the smallest pathogens known on Earth. A virate can be as small as 246 nucleotides long, and it's much smaller than even a prion gene. It's a tiny pathogen, but it has all the characteristics of a pathogen. And what is amazing about them, there are many things amazing about them, but one of these is that they are naked pathogenic RNA molecules, so they do not encode for any proteins. That's what we mean, naked. They, of course, they do bind to host proteins, but they not, do not encode any of their own. And then the, the genome, as we call it, so their RNA, is a single-stranded closed circular RNA molecule, and it ranges between 246 to 401 nucleotides. As I said, they do not encode any proteins, and they replicate either in the nucleus or in the plastic. There are two different groups of virids. Uh, people don't even know if they are convergent evolution or if they have common origin. They're quite different. Uh, one replicates exclusively in the nucleus, which are the ones we're going to be talking about today, and the others uh, replicate exclu exclusively in the plastics. Now, viroids, uh, of course, do not got any proteins, as I said, but they do have a code. So the, it is extremely important, and this has been shown with, with many, by many works before, that the uh, specific nucleotides in the virid contain all the necessary information for replication and movement uh, through the host uh, environment from cell to cell, systemically, from plant to plant, and they do cause significant uh, phenotypes. In fact, they're economically quite significant. Uh, for example, potato spindle tuber viroid, which is the type species and the one we mainly work with, is a quarantine uh, molecule, a quarantine pathogen in many countries, including the UK and Ireland, where you cannot even do experiments with. But even in my home country, in Greece, you can not work, you can work with, but you can, every imported a material that can be infected by this virus has to be checked for, so it's a current um, pathogen. Uh, a few years ago, it has been shown to be very important in chrysanthemum uh, cultures in uh, Holland. Uh, it's very important financially for losses in palm trees, which are monocots, by the way. Uh, it, it also infects peaches, and it causes there a very severe uh, effect in some cases. Uh, it's a very interesting story, this, but I have no time to talk about it. They also cause infections in uh, avocado, in apples, in cucumbers, and so on. So they're also economically very important, but they're also biologically very important. I would like to remind, especially for in-depth audiences here, that this is the first system where RDDM had been identified in plants. It's a seminal a paper in 1994 in a cell where RDDM for viroid related species by viroid infectivity has had been shown. The type species of viroid, PSTVD, uh, is a rod-shaped molecule. As I said, it's a closed circular molecule. This one is 359 nucleotides, and the, expect, the anticipated ter tertiary structure is a little bit like that. We don't really know this. And it does all this with this little structure it does all this infectivity, it reminds of viruses. That's why they're called virates, otherwise they're very dissimilar. But it does all this, what I said, what, what a virus does, and all these phenotypes you saw before, it does it just by the structure of this uh, secondary and tertiary structure of this uh, little sequence. In our lab, we have been working both with um, identifying the relation, the crosstalk between potato spittle tuber virate and other virates, with the silencing pathways. This is something I'm not going to talk about today, but also with the interaction of the virate with uh, host proteins, which of course are needed. And today I'm not only going to talk about these because you'll see that they, they have some relation with what happens in, in um, uh, chromatin and the nucleus. I remind you that this virate replicates solely in the nucleus. So we have been looking for, for factors that interact with viroids. Uh, one of the first ones was uh, known was POL2. So DNA-dependent RNA POL2 is the one that replicates the virus. In this case, it, it functions as an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and it does a lot of mistakes, by the way. 
but of course, we're not looking for, for things so prominent like that. We're looking for, for proteins that would be, uh, let's say, important for the virus, but not so important maybe, maybe for the plant. And we, we, we used a three hybrid system. And through this, we fished out a couple of proteins. The most strong binder of this was a protein we called VIRP1, virid binding protein 1. I don't know if it was the best name given to it, but nevertheless, that's what it is. And since we have verified by barium, this means that it does strongly interact with, with the virids, and not only with our favorite virid, but with all the nuclear virids we have tested. This is a very interesting protein, I think you will find. It's an interesting protein because it's a bromo protein. Bromo domains are domains that read acetylated lysine on the chromatin. So there are uh, chromatin interactors to some, to some way. In humans, there are the BRD4 is a very famous bromo domain protein. Bromonet, so a bet proteins these are called. So ours has a bromo domain and a net uh, domain, but it also has a nuclear localization signal, uh, and it has some intrinsically disordered regions, especially at the end. And uh, there is that we can hypothesize quite easily. I think that the, that the software show this by prediction that it would be um, uh, one of these proteins that uh, do phase transitions. It is localized really in the nucleus. We have fused it to GFP and it goes in the nucleus. And in fact, it goes to, as you see, FOSSA in there. This is a magnification from this image and not from this specific, but from these specific uh, tissues, but not these specific images. And you can see that uh, these FOSSA are somewhere in the nucleus, but they're not exactly as everywhere as a double stain would be. So it's not all over. It's just in specific regions. This is from a protoplast image and what you see here red is alkyloplast. So it's clearly going to the nucleus and only to the nucleus. But what was striking about this protein is that when we generated knockdown mutants through RNAi, and these were not extremely efficient ones, so we, we brought down this protein to something like 40, 30% of its original amount. These plants were resistant to viral infections, not only PSTBD that we show here, but also other viruses. So these are the, the wild type. This is a marker, it's a transgenic plant which does not do RNAi. And the transgenic plants show hardly any infection, even after many months. We did the same with tobacco. There we did have some remnants of infection a few weeks later, but really, really very low amounts. And this is only under circumstances. We later showed in a paper of 2014, we later showed that these stop also satellite RNAs of viruses that also have to go to the nucleus from infecting. So this is a, a protein which is important for uh, importing RNA into the nucleus somehow and maybe bringing it close to the chromatin since it has a problem. Uh, now, this is unpublished. What I showed you up till now is published. Stuff. What I showed here is unpublished. So we did a deep sequencing analysis of these RNAi plants. I remind you that these are knockout plants, not knockdown plants, not knockout plants. So there's only a suppression, but not knockout of the protein. And we, we, we got an original list of, of um, genes going up and down from the genome facility where we did the sequencing through three prime RNA sec. Uh, but then we, we went further and did our own analysis with more, more stringent and more stringent filters. I think the most stringent we had was the D sec 2 And this gave us a small um, number of genes that were supposed to be uh, suppressed or overexpressed under this uh, suppression of this um, specific gene. And what are these genes? So these, these genes that we identified and then we tested by qPCR and we verified that indeed they go up and down are quite interesting ones. There are, there are genes re, re, related to cell wall biogenesis and to iron starvation. And um, they're also uh, related to RDDM, which is very exciting because this is a bromonet uh, protein, but also a little bit, we found genes related to photoperiodism and to lipid metabolism. I remind you that this is strictly the very few genes uh, it's 14 altogether that go up and down, and they're very, very uh, strongly affected, shown also and verified by qPCR. If we go to the bigger picture, so a bigger number of genes affected, they're also within the same groups. And to, to show this, we went into geo analysis, and indeed, we identified all these yellow and reds are the genes that the yellows are the genes uh, related. We found that the uh, genes affected in these VIRP suppressed plants uh, fall into these four categories. 
iron ion homeostasis, regulation of photoperiodism, cell loss metabolism, cell wall general regeneration, and responses to stress. So this is quite interesting to see why. This was done in Bethaniana, which doesn't have such a good, such a well annotated genome. We repeated the same arapidopsis. Uh, and again, we saw similar categories coming up as the most important ones in terms of uh, up and down regulation upon FIB1 suppression. Next, we decided to mutate the, this uh, protein, and we mutated it especially in the bromo domain. We targeted the bromo domain, the cleft, where it identifies and reads the acetylated lysine. And we predicted that this um, changes these mutations to affect the specific, the specific cavity where this interaction takes place. And then we are asking, what does that do to the plant and what does that do to the virus? Unfortunately, in order to test this, we need real mutants, not RNAi mutants. And for this, we're now generating CRISPR plants. We're very close to getting them actually, but we don't have them yet fully characterized. So we're anticipating these plants in order to do complementation analysis to see what these do. Until then, we can only work on um, the Pamnian agroinfiltrated tissues. And then, in fact, when we do use these specific mutants, we see that the, their localization through fusion with GFP is indeed different depending on the mutation. So the localization of the nucleus is different depending on the changes we made on this lysine reading uh, cavity. So indeed, there is some difference in the way they are, these are located next to the protein. What does that uh, do the chromatin? What does that mean for the virus? It remains to be seen. So to summarize, um, upon VIP1 suppression, gene evolved in cellular metabolism, iron homeostasis and stress response are mainly affected. Mutation affecting the VIP1 acetylated lysine binding affect also the localization phenotype of the protein. And CRISPR mutants, knockout mutants, are underway. And these are going to be used to complement them with our VIRP mutants to see how this affects the plant and how this affects the uh, virus effectivity. By the way, our plants are only mildly, have a very, very mild, almost unidentified phenotype when VIRP is suppressed. Um, and we're trying to understand how this can be with a protein that seems to be uh, generally quite important. There is some change in the cell wall structure, but that's all. Um, we're, we're trying to summarize our whole project is we're trying to understand the role of VIRP1 in virus infections, but also for the plant physiology. We would like to have these two, two things separated because if we could, if we could generate plants that are uh, have all the functions that VIRP, um, for which VIRP is required for the plant, but manage to suppress the functions that it's required for the virus, if this is possible, then we could have a nice breeding target to breed plants uh, resistant to virus and satellite RNAs. Um, and this is all. I would like to thank uh, people that uh, funding boards that have funded us through the time, through the years. These are the ones that are currently funding us, uh, national and international. I would also like to mainly uh, mention that it was Irini Bardani has been doing most of the VIRP work now, currently, she's a PhD student. And Paskevi Kalemi has been working on a parallel project, looking at other very interesting proteins interacting with the virus that I have no time today to present, but I may have another day. And uh, Konstantina Katsaru, who is more or less overseeing these projects at the same time in the lab. And I would also like to thank you, my audience, uh, for, for being with me today. Thanks very much.